I've always noticed that if I'm writing a lyric, sometimes my sentences come out to be around the same length and shape all the time. <laughs> like little four bar phrases, you know? And uh, I was thinking consciously long, long time ago, I'd like to write longer lyrics, longer sentences, but not too much prose, boring, you know, speaking. I want it to be melodic and I still want it to be sort of poetic or whatever. And I came across this article where John Lennon had said he'd never be able to redo Across the Universe again. And I thought, well, if you really wanted to, you just write a lyric to Across the Universe and make sure your strong and weak syllables lined up with across the universe. And basically I was noticing that across the universe is just a bunch of run-on sentences. You know, it's like, words are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. They slither while they pass, they slip away across the universe. It's one big, long, crazy sentence, you know? So I was commuting in those days uh, on the different trains and commuter rails to get to work at Berkeley. And I would just sit there with that melody and all that prosody in my head, and I would come up with my own things to say. And I came up with, Ooh, it's taken all I have and all I've been through. Page on page, the lines continue on and on. So please don't quit me now. And I ended up writing a whole song that the blueprint of my song, my lyric, fit across the universe. And then all I did was write my own melody and my own chords. And my song doesn't sound anything like Across the Universe, but the skeleton of it, the shape of the sentences, they do this in poems. You know, you pick a poem form and you write and you stick to that length of line or those types of how many syllables per line if you're doing haikus and things like that. So um, that's one way it could be interesting. I did it with a Tears for Fears song too, because I liked it and uh, wrote my own lyric to their song and then wrote my own melody and chords to my new lyric and the blueprint of it fit, fit that Tears for Fears song. Another thing you can do is like take a joke. Uh, when I was a kid, there, uh, hello everybody else who's joining us, glad to click you in and see you. You all look very cute. It's very nice to be together today. Um, we are recording so you won't have necessarily missed the beginning. We just decided to jump in and start right away. So I can send you the recording when we're done. Uh, my brother, when I was a child, we were both child's children. I come from a family of four kids and I'm the oldest. And my brother had a thousand and one insult book. <laughs> and when I flipped through the insults, the one that I thought was really the funniest and fun was why don't you pretend that you're somebody pleasant? <laughs> and so I have a song that's very jazzy that I've never released yet that I really think I should because it's good. And it's called, why don't you pretend that you're somebody pleasant? And it just goes like that, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> again, it's one of those sentences that if you look for the strong and weak beats in the rhythm of the words, you can find a melody. It, the, the words themselves help you find a melody. So you could take a joke. Uh, I remember having dinner with a bunch of friends and I don't remember even what restaurant I was at, but there was a waitress that was fantastic. And I just turned to everybody and said, my God, she's the greatest waitress in the world. And one of my friends said, I dare you to put that line in a song. And I was working on a, you can call me Al lyric anyway. I was working on a lyric like a Paul Simon song where I just didn't want it to make any sense. I wanted it to be a bunch of gibberish. And I thought that's the song that line has to go in. <laughs> and even when you deliberately try to write a lyric that's gibberish, which is funny, um, you find that um, by the end of the lyric, it makes sense to you because you can't necessarily not make sense. You know, you or a human being, you have your intentions, you have your feelings and your thoughts and emotions, and the words you choose are saying something about you anyway, even <laughs> when you're trying not to make sense. So those are funny things. Uh, I don't know if you ever noticed, but there's a Billy Joel song called The Stranger, and um, it starts off with an introduction that's really mellow.
And then also the band kicks in. So it was very interesting to me that there was this mellow, interesting intro, kind of like a mask, kind of like a, um, uh, you know, like a, a, a hidden rapping to the song and then the song, and then he ends the song with the same rapping again. So I thought that was really cool. So I remember when I had cats in those days, before I had dachshunds, I was in apartments and one of my cats was ill and I was playing something very sad because I knew her days were numbered and I was playing this sad little intro thing and I thought, but let's not write a sad song. Let's write an up tune. So I used the sad intro and then made it an up positive song. And I used that as the rapper with that sort of the stranger Billy Joel thing in mind. So there's something you could do as well. And then this one was like one of my most favorite ones. You know how we all have digital cameras and now we all have phones that are cameras basically in our pockets. But when you save photographs, they have numbers and they have like even a roll of film would have had numbers. They don't have names. But I had gone through and named a bunch of pictures on my first digital camera roll on my computer to remember which picture was which of my new dog when I first got a dog and it was my first dog of my life so I, I was very excited and, and um, one of the pictures was wide-eyed because her eyes were like this and this little dachshund face you know and another one was holding her outside and she was so small at the time like three and a half pounds you know and uh, I called it together in the sun and there was another one where she was by the garden that I was growing some vegetables but because she's a dachshund and she's so short it looked like a jungle Right. So I th was playing around with a little guitar idea and I thought, oh, my God, this little guitar thing is the sweetest thing. And then she came waddling in and I went, no, 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 she's the sweetest thing. And so I wrote a song called Sweetest Thing because of that little cool guitar idea. And I put that that was the main part of the song that made me write it, this nice little counterpart. Uh, point uh, guitar thing. And then I thought, well, what can I say? You know, and, and then the pictures were doing the screen shave, saving thing on my computer and those pictures are going by. So I just said, wide eyed, you tumbled down by my side, making me laugh so childlike rolling on the floor. Cause I'd always be on the floor playing with her. And I was 43 years old at the time. You know? <laughs> Grownups aren't necessarily supposed to be rolling on the floor playing with their dogs, but I highly recommend it and I still do it. <laughs> so the whole lyric was from these pictures and the photographs because they had titles. And uh, another verse was garden deep as a jungle, you run every moment a new day together in the sun. You know, it was just like the lyrics were so easy because I was using titles of photographs as the jump off to give me ideas of what I wanted to say. So it takes a lot to be able to play well, to be able to play in time, to be able to play in tune to be able to sing with confidence, to be able to sort of say what you want to say and not be apologizing for it or feeling insecure about it. You know, these are the things that they don't teach us how to perform. Even if you become a performance major, they don't teach you how to perform, you know? It's like we need some acting as well. <laughs> you need to have sort of this persona of, hey, I'm here and I'm singing this song and it's good, you know. You got to like believe in your own thing kind of thing. So if any of you are having thoughts that you don't like your voice when you sing or you don't play a decent groove when you play rhythm, whatever, just secretly work on that stuff. You don't have to sing for people if you're not ready. But if you really want to sing, don't not sing your whole life. Just work on it, you know and you'll eventually get better at it. And the more you record yourself and videotape yourself and privately assess it and compare it to what you like and put more into it of what you like. And when you see somebody on stage or you see somebody in recording footage and they're doing something good, how are they doing it? What is their body like? How are they singing? How are they playing? You know, like take by osmosis, all the things you can learn from every artist that you really admire and use it, you know? You find people do that all the time. They have role models, they have mentors, they have, you know, well, when I sing this one, 
you know, I like to pretend I'm Ray Charles, Paul will say, or when I sing that one, uh, you know, I'm trying to be Elvis, or I'm, you know, and it's in their head. It's just a a little bit of confidence. It's not like they sound like that person, really, but it's an attitude, and it's a bit of a, you know, like a colored shell, uh, like a, a gel that you put on a camera. It gives it a different color because it's a different shade of their voice, a different color of their voice, and it gives them the confidence to do the performance they want. And it comes out like them, and then it turns out that they've got like 17 different sounds of their voice that they can use uh, because they imitate so many different people going to get those different sounds to make that song have a different personality. It's very fun. Amazing. fun i mean you can do anything it's just such an interesting sound it's a creative muscle definitely and the sky's the limit and we are creative beings and the whole idea of being on earth at this time as a human being the power we have over most other life forms is that we have this ability to focus and when you focus your attention on something you make something more so if it's something you're focusing on that's really positive, you're going to make that more. If it's something that's really negative, you're going to make that more. And you're going to create something in your mind first, and then you're going to make it real. You know, we're alchemists that way. Take a sad song and make it better. Uh, you know, take a lump of clay and turn it into something magnificent. Um, you have that power. And I think that's pretty much the coolest thing about being a songwriter, is that you have, you create something out of nothing. Literally, it seems like out of thin air. Yeah. Yeah. I never liked looking at music in a competitive way anyway. To me, we're just all in this together. And isn't it cool that we get to be us and we get to do this and we get to be together? I mean, can you believe this is even your school or this is my job? I mean, come on. <laughs> it's just so cool. <laughs> because you are what you do, right? I and mean, we're human beings, we can just be, and that's enough. We don't have to do anything really, nothing's required. <laughs> but for your own self-satisfaction or to create meaning every day as an artist, you just feel good if you've played or you've practiced or you've written something or you just did what you said you were gonna do. And I think one of the things I've always admired about a schedule, even though I'm an artist and prefer no schedules, is that it always amazes me when something gets done. You know, when you give it regular time, like if you say from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. every night, I'm going to work on my writing or, you know, from two to three every day, I'm going to practice bass or whatever. As soon as you decide something, that's where the power is. And then you commit to it and do it a few times. You start a momentum and then you look forward to it. The hardest thing is beginning. It's an Irish saying, they say like 50% of the work is just trying to figure out how to start. So being able to step into it shows you that you can get done anything that you care to get done. You just have to care about something. You just have to want to do it and then you do it. Um, I, I just think it's an awesome thing that, uh, you know, we can turn it on anytime we want to. That was the biggest freedom I discovered. And then I figured that out as a kid. You know, everybody else would say writing is hard or creativity is hard and all that kind of thing. And I disagree, you know. I love when uh, David Grohl is talking to Paul McCartney <laughs> and he says, why can't it always be this easy? And Paul says, it is, <laughs> you know. It's a, it just depends on who you're listening to. So here's the main thing I want you to remember about life or this class or writing or anything is if you're taking advice from somebody, and you want to know what they think, make sure they're in a good mood when they're talking to you. <laughs> because when people are talking to you, they're sort of telling you where they're at. They're not telling you anything about you. If they've got a comment or they've got something to say that's negative, it's usually about them. It's not even about your work or about you or your song, you know. And uh, you have to remember that. You've got to, you know, realize a lot of times they're not even a songwriter. They're not even a musician. So 
you shouldn't even have to care about what they think about what you're doing. And uh, again, like Paul would say, um, someone would say to him, you know, why do you keep doing this? You know, you certainly don't need the money, you know, and you, why don't you just retire for once and like let somebody else do it? It's a young person's game. And he'd just say, I'm supposed to stop what I enjoy for you. You know, like, why should he stop living? Why should he stop being him? Just because somebody thinks it's time for him to slow it down. Again, I've always said rock and roll is too young, right? Our first rock and rollers that are getting into their 70s and 80s are the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. <laughs> you know, we, we allow blues players to be that old, jazz players, all kinds of things. Painters, sculptors, oh, the great person. That great scholar, we're so glad they're old and they're mature and they have the knowledge and the, uh, you know, all that history of work and fantastic collaboration and things they've contributed to society. But rock and roll, no, no, once you pass 17, you're over it. <laughs> it's just such an old, silly thing that people thought. So.